Is there going to be a suburban swing back to the Republicans? If so, how big is it going to be? On this episode of Transition Virginia. Things get squirrely around this time in Virginia. Squirrely around this time in Virginia. I don't know about that. We talk about the hottest house races across Virginia with Chaz Nuttycomb. It is the purest, tossiest of toss-ups. From Northern Virginia and Virginia Beach to Richmond and Southside, we take a look at about a dozen House incumbent Democrats who are being targeted by Republicans. It is a literally flip a coin, flip a coin, All that flip a coin, and a, a coin, few predictions on this episode of Transition Virginia. I'm Michael Pope. I'm Thomas Bellman. And this is Transition Virginia, the podcast documenting the ongoing transition of power in Virginia politics. We've got a dynamite show for you today. We're going to look at the hottest house races across Virginia. The Republican State Leadership Committee is targeting about 13 house incumbents, and we've got the best guest here to walk us through these districts and get a sense of what's happening in these races. Returning to the podcast is our friend, the director of C Analysis, an election forecasting group that specializes in state legislative races. You can also hear him on the C Analysis podcast. Chaz Nutty Cub, thanks for coming back. Hey, thanks so much for having me on again. It's good to talk to you guys. We've got to start with these two really hot races, the Roz Tyler seat in Southside and the Chris Her seat out in Blacksburg. Chaz, what do you make of these two marquee races here? Let's start with the Delegate Tyler. You know, of all of these races, of all these incumbents that are kind of being targeted by Republicans, this is the lone standout in terms of the veteran. She was first elected back in 2005, so she's been in the House quite some time. She's running against Republican Otto Washman. Chaz, what do we make of this race for House District 75? Yeah, I've got it as a toss-up. Look, Ross Tyler had the closest re-election of anybody on the Democratic side in the House delegates in 2019. She had a closer call than expected. And the thing about the South Side region is it hasn't been since 2005 when Tim Kaine was elected governor that uh, the region swung leftward from the previous presidential election. Even Ralph Northam, while he was winning by nine points statewide, South Side, that region still, you saw rightward swing from 2016. So that's one thing that makes this race really competitive. Roz Tyler really hasn't even had a competitive race in uh, over a decade, decade and a half even. And uh, Washman uh, didn't really have much of a campaign in 2019, yet came so close, and now he's got a pretty good operation. This is definitely the Republicans' best pickup opportunity. I'd still say, you know, it's it's going to be a very close race. Yeah, I agree with that. Tyler's race is most likely a toss-up. Tyler won in 2019 by about 500 votes over the same candidate, and. One benefit that Roz Tyler has going into this race is that the governor is also on the ballot. And so while, yes, it's a toss up, I think she's probably going to be OK. But, you know, things get squirrely around this time in Virginia. So the other marquee race in terms of all of these House races is Delegate Chris Hurst. Now, he knocked off Joseph Yost back in 2017. Hurst was part of that wave of Democrats that won so many seats back in 2017. He's running against Republican Jason Ballard. Chaz, what do we make of this race? Yeah, um, I think Ballard is definitely the best candidate, honestly, that has run against Chris Hurst, even better than Yost, even though Yost was the incumbent. This is going to be a very tough race for me to pick. There are going to be three races when I'm casting the final predictions. What I do in the final predictions is I eliminate toss-ups. And uh, this is one of the toss-ups that I'm going to have a really hard time picking for a good amount of reasons. Look, Chris Hurst was one of the few candidates who flipped district in 2017 that outran Ralph Northam. The only other candidate that did that was Jennifer Carroll Foy. So he was he was a stellar candidate in 2017. All right. And I want to say a big reason why that is, is because, you know, he was fresh off TV. We see how people on local TV can really overperform in elections. You can look at 2020's New Mexico Senate race with Mark Ronchetti, the Republican, running several points ahead of Donald Trump. It was a single-digit race while Trump was losing New Mexico by double digits. Chaz, do you get the sense that um, Chris Hurst has maintained that momentum from 2017? No. 
No, absolutely not. Look, and that's kind of what I want to get out here. You know, uh, Chris is not the – he doesn't have the candidate quality he had in 2017. It's been, you know, four years uh, since he's been on TV. And uh, not only that, but, you know, you have the drinking while driving scandal. Uh, he wasn't arrested or anything like that. But but here's the thing, though, about that. The Ballard campaign only just recently started running attack ads on him for that. So it's pretty surprised that it took him that long. I want to say it was like the last one or two weeks they decided. So they waited until October to do that. I see that as Chris Hurst's Achilles heel. And they've waited so long to tap at it. What's interesting about um, bringing up a DUI Chaz, is the Democrats actually tried to bring up a DUI against Matt Ferris, not Blacksburg, but still out in that direction. And when the Democrats brought up Matt Ferris's DUI, his vote share actually increased above what was expected, and they could trace it to the DUI mailers that they sent out. And so I'm wondering, is there a chance that the DUI makes Chris Hurst seem like an everyman? Uh. I don't know about that. <laughs> I, I'm not. I'm not aware of the Matt Ferris thing. You know, I'll say that Matt Ferris is in a much better district. Uh, what year was this? Oh, this was about almost ten years ago now. 2011. Yeah, 11 or 13. 11 or 13. Okay. Well, I mean, 2011 we had new lines as well, so that could be one thing. Mm. But uh, I don't think there's really any any argument for that. No boost for Hurst. I think um, uh, it's very unbecoming, and I think uh, the attack ads will be – we'll see how effective they are. But I don't think Chris Hurst is going to run ahead of uh, – unless there is a pattern to where, unlike 2017, you know, you have many House incumbents running ahead of McAuliffe. You know, I, I think it's more likely that we're going to see the incumbents in the House run behind him by a few points. I think Chris is going to be no exception to that. Also worth pointing out, this is going back into very ancient history, but right before the 2000 election in November of 2000, it came out that George W. Bush had a drinking and driving arrest from his days back when his drinking days, he had sobered up by the time he ran for president, but it didn't seem to have too much of an influence there. So just some ancient history sort of laying the groundwork for how people sometimes react or don't react to those sorts of things. I don't think it's really a accurate comparison, um, given the amount of time between, you know, when George Bush was running and uh, the actual DUI. And meanwhile, this is while Chris Hurst was in office. So it's, it's a very big difference when you are an incumbent and drinking while driving compared to, you know, something, you know, you did uh, many, many years ago in your in your youth. So I, I think there's a big difference there. Okay, now turning our attention to Northern Virginia, there are a handful of interesting seats that are being contested in Northern Virginia. Let's start in Loudoun with House District 10. We've got Delegate Godidas. She was part of that wave of Democrats that swept many seats in 2017. She knocked off Randy Minshew back in that 2017 race. This year, she's running against Nick Clemente. Chaz, what do we make of this race for House District 10? I think this is a toss-up race as well. I think uh, Goditis is very much in danger, and I think uh, Nick Clemente is by far the best recruit the House GOP has for the 2021 cycle. I think he's a stellar candidate. Why is that? Oh, I mean, his ability to fundraise. He's run a great campaign. He's a young, uh, attractive candidate. And uh, I think, you know, there's an argument to be made that he may be even stronger than Minshew, you know, uh, in terms of, I mean, look, Minshew already tried making a comeback bid in 2019. And yes, while 2019 was still a blue wave year, I still think that having a fresh face is definitely the best path forward for Republicans in this seat. And, uh, you know, this seat may not even really be that competitive after redistricting. We'll see what happens with redistricting. That's a totally different conversation. It's also a headache. But <laughs> um, I think Clemente is a really good candidate. He's outraised Goditis throughout the cycle uh, up until this point. Now Goditis has a money advantage. And this is going to be a tough race for me to pick. But I think it's a pure toss up. Plain and simple. This is going to be a nail biter. Yeah, I had a chance to sit down for a couple of drinks with Wendy Goditis' 2019 campaign manager, who actually listens to this podcast. And he's also worried about Wendy Goditis being able to hold on because of all the things you just said, Jazz. Well-funded candidate. This may be the 
best recruit they could have found to go up against her in this election cycle. And as you mentioned, Randy Minshew's popularity was definitely on the way out. And this guy seems to be on the way up. Right. All right. Turning our attention to House District 28, this is the seat that used to be held by former Speaker Bill Howell. It was held for a hot minute by Bob Thomas, who was knocked off in 2019 by Joshua Cole. So now Cole is running for re-election against Tara Durant. This is also one of the hottest House races across Virginia. Chaz, what do we make of this House race for District 28? Yeah, this is another one of those seats, just like the 12th in the toss-up column. I'm going to have a very hard time picking when it comes to eliminating toss-ups and picking a winner. I think that Josh is definitely going to have a closer race than he did in 2019, uh, not only because of different environment, but I would say his win number, um, you know, his margin of victory was arguably inflated given the division between the Stafford Republicans. You know, they just came off of a deeply divided, tight contest between Bob Thomas and Paul Mildy. Mildy beat Thomas in the primary. They ran against each other in 2017 as well. And uh, there was another close contest then, but this one was just between the two of them. And so now, though, you have the staff Republicans united in their candidate, Tara Durant, I think she's an all right candidate. A lot of Republicans, especially in Stafford, seem to be pretty bullish on her. She's raised a good amount of money. She's run, I guess, a decent campaign. But, you know, regardless, this is a seat that did vote for Donald Trump in 2016. It did vote for Biden, though, in uh, 2020 by, you know, high single digits. But this is going to be a tough race to pick. Josh Cole has some built in structural advantages being a black pastor very plugged in with his community and a young guy who energizes his progressive base. But I really like the point you made, Chaz, that the Republican Party in the last cycle was divided. And now they are united behind their candidate. And that is going to kind of eliminate those structural advantages that Josh Cole had. That being said, I look at all of the races we're talking about today, and I remember that incumbents win now more than 88% of the time. So the chances are, most of these people are going to be fine. Uh, and there is a huge baked in incumbency advantage, even for Josh Cole. But it's one that I I watch him. I love his messaging. And I think he could possibly do even better than we expect. But it's the one that if we lose anyone in Northern Virginia, that's who my money's on. Turning our attention to Prince William, we've got Delegate Elizabeth Guzman in House District 31. This is yet another one of these seats that Democrats won in 2017 when Guzman knocked off Delegate Scott Lingamfelter. The Republican in the race is Ben Baldwin. Chaz, what do we make of this race for House District 31? I think Guzman's likely to be fine. I'd give her at least an 8 in 10 chance of winning re-election, maybe even a 9 in 10 chance. Ben Baldwin doesn't really have <laughs> much of a campaign at all. You know, it's really interesting. Um, they had a really good candidate here in 2019, the Republicans uh, and DJ Jordan, but they couldn't get him to run for the seat this time. I think if DJ Jordan was running again, I think this would be a much more competitive race, possibly even near the pretty near the toss up territory. But they weren't able to get him. They got this um, random, random guy who's run like a very skeletal campaign. So, uh, you know, if Youngkin's like winning, even if he's just winning by, you know, a hair, this could be a race that would flip. You know, it takes it would take a pretty enormous red wave, not just a red like tide. Like I think there's going to be I think Republicans pick up a few seats, but I think the Democrats hold everything by the skin of their teeth when it comes to the House. And then you have relatively close races for the statewides. It would take a Republican overperformance compared to my expectations for the seat to flip. Yeah, Guzman made a very wise decision by dropping out of her statewide race in order to hold on to her House seat. And that, I think, is going to make all the difference in this race. Had she not done that and it were an open seat because she hadn't ran again, uh, then I think that it would be very much a toss-up in anybody's race. But Guzman here ultimately pending some mysterious red wave that has not yet materialized. Guzman is going to be okay. Turning our attention to Centerville, we've got Delegate Dan Helmer in House District 40. 
he was able to knock off delegate Tim Hugo in 2019. So this is not a seat that flipped in 2017, um, but sort of came later in that 2019 election cycle. Uh, delegate Helmer is running against Harold Pion. Chaz, what do we make of this race for House District 40? Yeah, we've got this seat as tilt Democratic. So Helmer's got like a 60% chance of uh, winning re-election. I could even see this race going up a notch in the final predictions up to like a 70% chance to the lean Democratic column for Helmer. I think Pion's uh, run a pretty good campaign. I think he's had a few missteps. But look, one thing that he would need to do in order for an upset here is the minority immunities in the 40th would need to be peeled off and he would have to overperform with them, especially the Asian American community. Ben Trevitt made a good point about that on how that was how Republicans were able to win back some of the Orange County, California seats in 2020. You know, they ran great Asian American candidates like um, the congressman from uh, California's 39th, uh, Young Kim. Not Young Kim, Young Kim. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, yeah, so. I think uh, if he's able to do that, you know, I think you can definitely see an upset here. Helmer uh, has been, you know, winning the money race and whatnot, uh, of course. But, uh, you know, I, I think he's favored. I think he's favored. I, I, if, um, you know, I'm the head of Democratic Party, I'm not sweating the seat too much. Um, it's just something that I would keep on the radar. Yeah, that's the district I actually grew up in. Uh, Michael and Chaz and Dan Helmer knocked on my parents' door and my mom very nicely asked him for a sign. And so she has the, for the first time ever, a McAuliffe Helmer yard sign for any candidate in front of her house. Um, and she tells me the reason she asked for that is because the Republican opponent is winning the yard sign war, at least in her neighborhood for sure. She's in the 5050 Deer Park precinct, but Helmer has an advantage in that the vote continues to trend more and more blue in that district, specifically in those 50-50 suburban precincts. And so ultimately, I think Dan, like you said, is somewhere between a 60 and a 70% chance to win. Harold Pion is so far down the list of potential Republican pickups that, again, I don't see it. Pending some giant red wave, Helmer's going to win. All right, let's take a break. When we come back, we'll take a look at contested races in the Richmond area and in Hampton Roads. And now another feature from Steve Artley featuring the voice talent of Kathy McGee on vocals. Row, 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 v. Wade, rules we obey. Merrily, 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 choice is here to stay. Row, 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 v. Wade, rules we obey. Row, 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 v. Wade, rules we obey. Merrily, 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 choice is here to stay. Row, 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 v. Wade, rules we obey. This is Steve Artley, and you're listening to my favorite podcast, Transition Virginia, with Michael Pope and Thomas Bowman. And we're back on Transition Virginia. We're talking about contested house races this year. We're joined by our friend Chaz Nuttycomb. And let's turn our attention to the Richmond area. Um, We've got Delegate Rodney Willett in House District 73. This is one of those seats, one of those many seats that flipped in 2017 when Deborah Rodman knocked off John O'Bannon. Rodman, of course, had an unsuccessful campaign for the Senate, so she's not around anymore. We've got Delegate Rodney Willett, and he's facing Republican Mary Margaret Castleberg. Chaz, what do we make of this race here for House District 73? I think Willett is favored. You know, I will say he outran my expectations in terms of margin of victory in 2017. 
I thought this was going to be a, it was going to be a much tighter race. I think he won by like four and a half points. I want to say, um, so almost five points. So you know, I think he's a good fit for the district. I think Castleberg is a very good candidate. Don't get me wrong. I think she's like the perfect candidate Republicans to get for the seat. And you know, look, Castleberg did outraise Willett in the last quarter, but. Uh, I think at the end of the day, we've got this seat as tilt Democratic, so like 60-40, 60% chance uh, will it wins. But I think this seat is going to end up in the final predictions in the 70-30 column for lean Democratic. This is another one of those seats just like uh, the Helmer seat, House District 40, where it doesn't require a young victory. It would have to require a very tight race for Virginia governor, likely within four points. If McAuliffe is winning by... You know, more than four points. Um, I, I think uh, I think Willett should be able to hold on. Chaz, you mentioned that Rodney Willett overperformed your expectations in 2019. My question is: Does the statewide candidates being on the ballot this time help Rodney Willett, or does this help Mary Margaret Castleberg? I mean, that kind of depends. Uh, you know, it depends on uh, how Youngkin is going to do with these suburban voters. Um, obviously. In uh, 2017, you know, you had O'Bannon swept out by just this massive blue tsunami, this backlash against Donald Trump and uh, the, the terrible campaign that Ed Gillespie ran. But I don't think uh, Youngkin has ran a, a uh, Ed Gillespie 2017 campaign. So I think uh, it, it all depends on that. Is there going to be uh, a suburban swing back to the Republicans? If so, how big is it going to be? If not, then, you know, Will it can hold on. And, you know, I would argue that let's say that there could be a possibility that, you know, you have some of these Democratic incumbents in competitive races who outrun McAuliffe. I think based on the 2019 results, I would say there's a strong argument that Will it could be one of them. I think there's a possibility of that. All right, Chaz, you mentioned that 2017 blue wave. Yet another one of those flips that year was Don Adams, who knocked off Minoli Lupasi there in the Richmond area. This year, Delegate Adams has a Republican candidate, Mark Early Jr., of course, a marquee name in Virginia politics. Chaz, what do we make of this race for House District 68? Yeah, look, this race was only so close, given Minoli Lupasi was just such a very, very wildly popular incumbent. This race was um, decided by what, like 300 votes in, in 2017, I want to say. And this seat is like one of the most rapidly trending uh, toward the Democrats, rapidly leftward trending seats uh, in the Donald Trump era. Um, it's a very, it, it will only elect the most moderate of moderate Republicans. Uh, and uh, Mark Early Jr. isn't really that. Munoli Lupasi was, but Lupasi isn't here. It's Mark Early Jr. This is a seat that, unless Youngkin is winning the gubernatorial race, is not going to flip. So we've got this as likely Democratic, just like the Guzman race, 80 20 uh, in terms of odds. So I think uh, Don Adams is likely to hold on. You know, the other thing to keep in mind, too, is I believe, correct me if I'm wrong. The Earleys are from Virginia Beach or thereabouts, and therefore Mark Early does not necessarily have an established network in Richmond. His dad also, yes, attorney general, however, not popular, and some people would characterize it as getting run out of the party toward the end. So Early Jr. might be the best Republican that they could come up with for the moment against Don Adams, but he had to move into the district. His family isn't really from around Richmond. And I still think having a local person in districts around Richmond matters, less so than transient areas like the beach or Northern Virginia. But I think it still matters here. So Mark Early Jr., also not his family not being super popular with the Republican establishment in town. I think Don Adams has been able to walk the line as an extraordinarily moderate Republican and be inoffensive to the Republican establishment in town. Another race in Richmond worth talking about is House District 72, currently held by Schuyler Van Valkenburg. Now, back in 2017, this was a seat that flipped from R to D. Delegate Jimmy Massey did not run again, so it was an open seat when it flipped to Schuyler Van Valkenburg. This year, he's got a Republican opponent, Christopher Holmes, not 
the guitar player for the heavy metal band Wasp, a different Chris Holmes. Uh, Chaz Nunnicombe, what do we make of this race for House District 72? Yeah, I would say uh, Skyler's got a, a lean Democratic race on his hands, possibly likely Democratic. But I, I think the final rating we're going to have for this seat is lean Democratic. Uh, this seat, when redistricting happened in 2019, it got a few points bluer. More um, black voters were put into Schuyler's district as they were moving the lines around. And uh, Schuyler won by, what was it, like six and a half points. Uh, I don't think he's going to get that margin. I think he wins by something around five uh, based on what I think is going to happen in November. Uh, on November 2nd, it could be a race that gets a little bit closer if he's running behind McAuliffe by a little bit or, you know, depending on what McAuliffe's margin is. So I think there's a chance for an upset. But again, this is this is going to take a much closer or not much closer, but a few points closer than expected race for governor than what I'm thinking is going to be happening uh, on November 2nd. Schuyler's a, you know, he's a popular incumbent. And look, in 2017, you know, he won by over five points, outperforming people's expectations in uh, the slightly redder seat. I think he's just so much more entrenched now that it's going to be harder for the Republicans to beat him. And, uh, you know, I don't think Chris Holmes has really run a great campaign whatsoever. I mean, they just got on TV, like, recently, like, within the last two or three weeks, maybe at the earliest four. So I, I think he's going to be fine, most likely. Yeah, Skylar Van Valkenburg, by the way, former guest of the show, and he's also a civics teacher and so and a very popular civics teacher at that local in the community. So he's turning out a couple hundred voters every year uh, who as a matriculate into being allowed to vote. So uh, Van Valkenburg, again, he's on the way up, but it is a squarely district. It's and I, we'll have a very different conversation most likely after the new redistricting maps are out. But for 2021, I think Skyler's going to be all right. Yeah, Delegate Van Valkenburg was on our episode about the readjusters. So he's that rare politician and elected official that not only is conversant in history, but actually cares about it and can talk about it at some length. Okay, turning our attention to Virginia Beach, there are four seats we want to talk about out there. Let's start with House District 21. This is Delegate Kelly Converse Fowler. Um, she was yet another one of these Democrats that knocked off a Republican back in the 2017 election cycle when she beat Delegate Ron Villanueva. This year, her Republican opponent is Tanya Gould. Chaz, what do we make of this race here for House District 21? I think uh, Gould has a very strong candidate profile, but she hasn't really run that great of a campaign. This is another one of those seats where it's going to require Youngkin either coming very, very close to winning. Um like uh, within, you know, within a point or, you know, Yunkin actually wins. It is interesting. You know, you got a large Filipino community and a large black community in this district. And those are two groups that did swing rightward in 2020, especially the Filipinos. You look at areas across the country where you had a large Filipino population. It depends on the area, but some of them had massive swing to the Republicans, 20, 30 points even. Uh, in these Filipino communities. And then some of them, uh, the rest of them, they're about the same. They, they say it about the same. So, and unfortunately, because Virginia does not, uh, they, they have, um, you know, a central absentee precinct and whatnot. We don't really have the data for that, for how the Virginia Beach Filipinos went in uh, 2020 in terms of swing exactly down to the precinct level. So if the Republicans can in Virginia can do what Donald Trump did last year and uh, really keep making inroads with minority communities, you know, they may be able to win this seat, even if, um, you know, Youngkin is, you know, losing by four points. Yeah. And by the way, Kelly Fowler has run a very interesting digital communications campaign because she is the first delegate I'm aware of to be on TikTok. So you can catch her there. And that does make her more approachable. It does connect her with people who are similarly interested. And some of it's political and some of it's slam dunking on <laughs> the Republicans in general. And not everybody loves every single TikTok, but the important point is that she's pushing out more and more and more content and she doesn't have to pay for it. Compare that with the Republican or any other traditional campaign. There's always room to improve. And I don't know that she's necessarily hit on the magic formula, but she's stumbled across something very interesting that could change future elections. 
first delegate to be on TikTok. Wow, that's really something. You would imagine because it is, as you point out, free, more of these elected officials would take advantage of that. On TikTok, yeah, there's actually a big um, – you'd be surprised on how well um, state legislators uh, do on TikTok. Unfortunately, um, a big TikTok star that did go down in 2020 was Matt Little, state senator from uh, Minnesota. He, But he represented a very red district. And then I saw this viral TikTok um, from the Kentucky Senate Democrats. They were uh, joining in on this one trend. And uh, yeah, I think uh, it's always entertaining to, to see that in my uh, in my For You page, the occasional um, state legislator on TikTok. Um, I, I forgot to mention the rating for this, by the way. We have this as likely Democrat. So Fowler's got like an 80% chance of winning. Yeah, one more note on TikTok. The algorithm actually advantages your local geography first. So they, when you put out a new video, it sends it to 100 people, both some of your followers and... Well, it sends it to all of your followers, but 100 people who aren't your followers. And that primarily goes out to people in your uh, regional geography. If that video performs well, then it pushes it out to 1,000 people who don't follow you. Again, more likely to be in your area. And... After that, if it continues to perform well, then it goes out to a wider and wider audience. So uh, including, by the way, people who are interested in the content that you're putting out according to the hashtags uh, it's, and your other followers, etc. So it's got a very nice structural advantage for um, legislators, as you say, because it's not based on who you know, it's based on who's nearby and what people like. Well, speaking of people who are nearby to Delegate Converse Fowler, one of those people is Delegate Nancy Guy in House District 83. This is not a seat that flipped in 2017. Instead, it's a seat that flipped in 2019 when Nancy Guy was able to knock off Delegate Chris Stolle. This year, her Republican opponent is Tim Anderson. Chaz, what do we make of this race for House District 83? Yeah, you know, the primary was so interesting here. Stolle was trying to come back, but Anderson beat him in the primary. Um, that was one of the few primary contests I got wrong. And uh, Anderson was running the Stolle's right. I think if Stolle had won this primary, this would be like a lean Republican pickup. Absolutely. In the lean Republican column, that would probably be the final rating. Guy only beat Stolle by uh, like what? Le- le- it, I know it was less than 50 votes. I want to say it was like 40 votes. It was close. Yeah, it was a nail biter. They had to do a recount, but you know that was against Stolle though in 2019, right? Uh, this is a, this is a district that voted for Biden by double digits in 2020, so it is a blue seat. It is a very not super blue, you know, deep blue like something like Don Adams. But I will say that I think Tim Anderson has run not a terrible campaign, honestly. Especially when you look at the campaign finance reports, uh, I think he's outperformed my expectations. I had this as Till Democratic right after uh, Anderson won, but then I had to move it back to toss up. This is going to be one of those races where I'm eliminating toss up. It's going to be a very tough pick. And 83rd was in one of those three races again in 2019. There were three races that were a tough pick for me in 2019. That was 66th, 27th, and 83rd. So the 83rd, this is another one of the, it's, it's going to be very tough for me to pick. It is the purest, tossiest of toss-ups. So that's the thing. Even if you know McAuliffe is winning by like five points, I could still see Nancy Guy going down. Um, so you know it is. It's a tough pick. Yeah, I always get nervous when we are talking about elections in Virginia Beach and the Hampton Roads area. One, the Republicans generally have a very strong political machine and operation out there. Too, there's a lot of military voters in that in those areas who are transient. So the electorate is not necessarily the same electorate that was there even in the last election. But as you said, Nancy Guy should be okay. The incumbency advantage here is going to be her friend. Also, not running against Stali is going to be her friend. So we'll see how she does on election day. But I think ultimately she hangs on. I didn't say that uh, she should be okay. I'm saying that it is a. Uh literally flip a coin literally <laughs> like oh i'm saying she should be okay yeah i'm saying she you're should saying be okay. so we hey that's your prediction <laughs> we'll see i mean i you may be right again because i just i just have no idea i literally have no idea who's going to win this it's going to be a tough call for me to pick here in, in uh two weeks from now rest assured our listeners will let us know <laughs> 
<laughs> one way or the other after the election oh, yeah. results come in. So another Virginia Beach seat worth looking at is the one held by Delegate Alex Askew. This is yet another one of those seats that flipped in 2017 when Cheryl Turpin knocked off Delegate Rocky Holcomb. Turpin, of course, is no longer on the scene because she ran an unsuccessful Senate campaign. So we've got incumbent delegate Alex Askew here. The Republican he's running against is Karen Greenhow. Chaz, what do we make of this race for House District 85? I got it as a toss up, but I think this race, I, I, I think in the final predictions, I'm going to have this as tilt Democratic. I think Alex Askew has run a you know, great campaign and now he's the incumbent. And I don't think Karen Greenhow has run a you know stellar campaign. I think she, you know it's not a not a bad campaign per se, but you know it's all right. You know this district did get bluer in redistricting. It used to be a Trump Biden district, and now it is a Clinton Biden district. But you know this isn't a double digit Biden district. Biden only won this by single digits. I want to say something like eight or nine points. And uh, you know Virginia is very much Republican. Uh, uh, favoring uh, down ballot. So it, it is sole toss up, but I think in the final predictions, I'm going to have this as tilt Democratic. Well, one last race I want to talk about in Hampton, where we've got Delegate Martha Mugler in House District 91. This is a seat that flipped in 2019 when Gordon Helsill did not run for re-election. So Martha Mugler won that seat when it was open. This year, her Republican opponent is A.C. Cordoza. Chaz, what do we make of this race for House District 91 in Hampton? Yeah, so there are only two uh, incumbent Democrats in the House who... Uh, incumbent Democrats in the House who were in competitive races who were actually able to uh, beat Biden's 2020 margin. And the other one is Chris Hurst. But I will note that, you know, 2020, you didn't really have in-person classes. So that was a big reason for that. Uh, at Virginia Tech, and now you do. Uh, go Hokies. <laughs> um, <laughs> and the other one was Martha Mugler. And, uh, you know, Martha Mugler's, you know, she doesn't have a college, you know, a big college in her district or anything like that. Um, it's just because Martha Mugler is a stellar, popular incumbent and now incumbent. She flipped this district in 2019 after her districting, but she's just a amazing fit for this district, for this district. Uh, and the Republicans didn't really get a good candidate against her for that reason, even though this district didn't even vote for Biden by double digits again, just like, um, you know, the 28th and the 12th and the 85th. And and the 75th and the um, 63rd, these are all seats that voted for Biden by single digits. But Martha Mugler was actually able to do better than what Biden could pull here. Uh, and that just goes to show you how, you know, good a fit for, she is for the uh, for the district. We have this as likely Democratic, and that's going to be the final rating for it. It's it's very it's going to be hard for the Republicans to put this seat. Well, Chaz, we're running out of time. So real quickly, I want to ask, what's your final prediction for the tally in the House? Uh, that's a good question. I think uh, I think the Republicans pick up like two seats, maybe three. Look, I think when it comes to the seats, I'm going to have the toughest time picking. It's going to be the 28th, which is Joshua Cole, the 83rd, which is Nancy Guy, and the 12th, which is Chris Hurst. Um, the other toss-ups, uh, I think... You know, you have, we have six toss-ups right now. The other three toss-ups, I would say 75, you know, this is still a gun to my head situation because I'm, you know, I'm eliminating toss-ups, but I think the 75th flips. and then This is the Ross Tyler seat, Yeah, Ross Tyler, that's correct. And then the other seat, I think, being forced to pick here, you know, eliminating toss-ups flips, I think is House Sister 10, which is winning Goditis. And then I think uh, Alex Askew holds on in the 85th. I think uh, Democrats... In our final forecast, they will either find they will find themselves close to fifty five percent, which is the threshold for a tilt Democratic rating, um, or they'll be just be under it. So the House is going to be either a toss up, uh, but just barely a toss up, or just barely tilt Democratic. I see uh, the losses somewhere between zero and two for the Democratic Party. I see Roz Tyler as an open question, and Josh Cole as an open question. Those particular districts is where momentum is slowest uh, for the Democratic Party in those areas. So that's all for this episode. Hit us up on social media or get in touch at transitionvirginia.com. 
There you can check the transcripts for this episode and find links to support the show on Patreon. Special thanks to Emily Cottrell, who transcribes every one of these so they're accessible to everyone. Thanks for listening to Transition Virginia. If you like what you heard, give us a five-star review. It helps other people find the show. We'll be back next week, so subscribe to the show so you don't miss a single episode. Transition Virginia is produced by Jack Legg Media, LLC. 